Okay, in this video we're going to pursue the holy grail, that is the climate sensitivity to carbon dioxide. Typically this is a doubling of carbon dioxide from so-called pre-industrial level of 0.03% to 0.06%. And it would apply to any doubling, say a doubling from 0.04, or if you like 400 parts per million to 800 parts per million. You would have the same... Uh, change in temperature. Now the molar mass version of the ideal gas law tells us that the climate sensitivity of CO2 is minus 0 0.02 degrees centigrade, or very close to that figure. How do we arrive at that? Now we'll go through this slowly. Uh, you might have seen, regulars might have seen my last couple of videos uh, on the ideal gas law, the molar mass version of it. And won't, we won't need to go over that old ground again, but it's a simple formula that involves the near surface atmospheric temperature in Kelvin, the pressure, near surface atmospheric pressure in KPA, the gas constant R, which is 8.314, rho, the near surface atmospheric density in kilograms per cubic meter, and large M, the near surface atmospheric mean molar mass in grams uh, per mole. Now, this is the formula that we're talking about. And uh, this is the formula we're going to use. And using that and commonly available figures, um, commonly available gas parameters for various planets, uh, for Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Titan, South Pole of Earth, Earth in general, and Venus. In brown there, you've got the actual temperature in Kelvin, and in blue, the calculated temperature in Kelvin using this formula. As you can see, they're all spot on apart from Mars. And that is because of the low pressure on the Martian surface. This formula and this... Uh, Hypothesis I'm putting forward here and, and uh, has one postulate, and that is really that we're only talking about atmospheric pressures of over 10 kilopascals on the surface. So it only applies to anything over that pressure. Okay, now we'll proceed here. This formula works on six planets and one moon, as you can see there, and of course the, the south pole of Earth. So it works on all planetary bodies with a thick atmosphere. So why wouldn't it work just as well for an Earth atmosphere with a double CO2 concentration? No reason. Note that the formula, which is not disputed by anyone thus far, states that the temperature is determined by the three gas parameters on the right of the equation, plus, of course, the gas constant. Some reflection upon the simplicity and accuracy of these results will bring an unbiased person to the obvious implications of this work. There are... These are that the residual, residual being the difference between the SB law results and actual, near surface atmospheric temperatures on planetary bodies with thick atmospheres, cannot be mainly determined by a so-called greenhouse effect, but instead most likely by an effect from fluid dynamics, namely adiabatic order compression. Another implication leads directly, and this is the one we're interested in, to the conclusion that the climate sensitivity to, for example, the doubling of the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration has to be operating instantaneously and also must be extremely low. Under this scenario, the climate sensitivity to CO2 cannot be very different to the addition of a similar quantity of any other gas. So there's no special greenhouse gases anywhere that we can detect in the solar system because this formula works for all the uh, planetary bodies with thick atmospheres. So using the properties of Earth from Wiki, we'll start off with that. 101.3 kPa pressure, 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter density, and the molar mass, average molar mass, 28.97. That gives us a calculated surface temperature on Earth of 288.14 Kelvin. Okay, now let's see what happens when we throw in an extra 0.03% CO2. But in particular, the above formula pr as presented here totally rules out any possibility 
that a so-called 33 degrees centigrade greenhouse effect of the type proposed by the IPCC in their reports can exist in the real atmosphere. The reason is that the IPCC stated in their reports that a 0.03% increase in atmospheric CO2, that is a doubling from pre-industrial levels, must result in a global temperature rise of about 3 degrees centigrade within a range of 1.5 to 4.5 centigrade. This range has hardly changed since the first IP, uh, IPCC report in 1990. This is the so-called climate sensitivity. Anything like this magnitude of warming caused by such a small change in gas levels is completely ruled out by the molar mass version of the ideal gas law. Let's do the calculations. So we'll calculate for a doubling of CO2 from the pre-industrial levels of 0.03%. The pressure P would increase by approximately 0.03%, which is 101.33 kPa. The density rho should increase by a little more than that 0.03% because CO2 is quite dense. Um, which brings us to, let's say, 5% extra, which is 1.2256 kilograms per cubic meter in density. The molar mass M should also increase by approximately 0.03%, like the pressure. So that would bring that to 28.979 grams per mole. Now, put those into the formula, and this is the calculated temperature after a doubling of CO2 from 0.03% to 0.06%, uh, the temperature will be 288.12 Kelvin. So the climate sensitivity to CO2 is 288.14, remember what, what we got for the uh, pre-industrial earth. So with the doubling, it would, it would be 288.12. So that gives us approximately minus 0.02 Kelvin. Oh. Now this change, of course, would be it's so small that it would be extremely difficult to measure in the real atmosphere. It is actually 100 times smaller than the so-called likely climate sensitivity of 3 degrees centigrade that is cited in the IPCC's reports. And is also probably of the opposite sign. But even that small number would likely be a maximum change because if fossil fuels are burned to create the emitted CO2, then atmospheric O2 will also be consumed, reducing that gas in the atmosphere and offset, offset, offsetting any temperature change generated by the extra CO2. This climate sensitivity of 0.02 degrees centigrade is already so low that it would be impossible to detect or measure in the real atmosphere even before any allowance is made for the consumption of atmospheric. So all you really need to know the temperature of a planet or part of a planet is the knowledge of the gas constant and three variable gas parameters. Average near surface atmospheric pressure, average near surface atmospheric density and the mean molar mass of the atmosphere. That will give you the average near surface temperature of the whole planet. Now the formula used here is the molar mass version of the ideal gas law. It's here demonstrated that the information contained in just these three gas parameters alone is an extremely accurate predictor of average near surface atmospheric temperatures in atmospheres over 10 kPf pressure. Therefore all information on the effective plus the residual near surface atmospheric temperature on planetary bodies with the atmospheres Residual meaning the difference between the effective, that predicted by SB black body law, and the measured actuality must be automatically baked in to the three mentioned gas parameters. This leads directly to the conclusion that a small change in any single atmospheric gas not only has little effect on atmospheric temperatures, but has a very similar effect to the same percentage change in any other atmospheric gas. It is seen, therefore, that no one gas particularly affects atmospheric temperatures more than any other gas. So there can be no significant greenhouse gases or no significant greenhouse warming caused by these greenhouse gases on Earth, or for that matter, in any other planetary body. Instead, it's proposed that the residual temperature difference, if there is one, of 33 centigrade on Earth and the tropospheric 
Thermal gradient observed are actually caused by adiabatic auto compression. Here's the references. Thank you.